I was so excited for my cousin Carrie when she finished school and got her degree. Our whole family was in awe as she explained that she was going to go work for a new startup quantum technology company. It would mean moving to California, and we wouldn't see her again for a couple years, she told us. The project was top secret, and she would be devoting every waking minute of her life to Proteon. I'd never heard of the place before, none of us had. But she seemed sure of herself and told us that the CEO, some guy named Garrett, was a genius, a savant. She said he was going to change the world, and she wanted to be a part of that. The thing is, now we haven't heard from Carrie in three years. We were expecting her to be busy, but now we're really getting concerned. Proteon tells us that she's fine, just extremely focused on her work. Even the police have been contacted and told us that she's been confirmed as safe and capable of intelligent decision making. They said she was there on her own free will, and they had no reason to doubt her. The cops told us it wasn't unheard of for family members to suddenly disappear and cease all contact. To start a new life. But something just doesn't feel right. And then on top of everything else, I got this email. It's a strange email to say the least. Just a bunch of doc files labeled observers with numbers assigned for each part or article or whatever these are supposed to be. I looked up the writer and found a few clues, but it's difficult to determine exactly who this guy is. But one thing's for sure. He knows where my cousin Carrie is. Each article refers to her specifically by name. And I get the feeling that this is some kind of call for help. That maybe she gave him my email in order to get this out to the public. Or maybe it was her who sent it to me. I can't tell based on the email because it's anonymous. Just a bunch of random letters and numbers assigned to a Gmail account. I don't know, maybe, maybe you folks can make some sense of this. Any help is greatly appreciated. I'm really worried about her. Anyways, here's the first of the files I received. Let me know if you find any clues to her whereabouts that I didn't notice. The Observers. First Draft. May 2020. Can you introduce yourself for the people at home not familiar with your company? Sure. My name's Garrett Stoneman. I'm CEO and lead engineer of Proteon Incorporated. And what kind of work do you do here at Proteon? Uh, aside from our meager overhead, almost 100% of our considerable resources goes into one project, which I've been working on for the past 10 years. It's an invention of my own creation. I like to call it Schrodinger's Tour Bus. So, tell me a bit about your invention. Well, in a way, it's exactly what it sounds like. What gave you the idea? How did you even get inspired to begin making something like this? I've been interested in science for years, particularly quantum physics and more recently quantum computing. Certain experiments really piqued my interest, and I spent many of my formative years attempting to recreate them and redesign them in various ways. How much do you know about quantum mechanics? Uh, pretend I know nothing, for the sake of the readers. Uh, that would take far too long. If people want to know about quantum physics, uh, they can learn about it on their own time. There's a bunch of theories, we could talk about them for a month. The most popular one, though, is the many worlds theory. In a nutshell, Many Worlds states that every decision we make creates a new reality, and that there are an infinite number of these realities, with more being created every second, every millionth of a second. Anyways, these theories stem from experiments done by pioneers in the field. One of these experiments was called the Double Slit Experiment, designed by Thomas Young in 1801. It's repeatable, and it completely upended the field of physics, all of science, really. I've heard of it. Pretty mind-blowing stuff. Can you quickly describe it for those unfamiliar? Oh, absolutely. The idea is you take a beam of particles, you shoot it towards a barrier with two slits in it, and they did this experiment with an expected result in mind, a hypothesis. But what they expected didn't happen. So they added more elements to the experiment, attempted to quantify their results, 
They found that the observations, well, they actually changed the outcomes. Uh, that's a pretty tricky one for people to get their minds around, isn't it? Oh, for sure. I remember doing a double take myself when I heard that the first time. So the fundamental revelation from that test was that just by people observing the experiment, the outcome changed. So what does that mean exactly for the layperson? Well, quantum researchers have been trying to decipher that ever since. All kinds of research and fields of study stem from that experiment and a few others. Schrodinger's cat is another very famous example. Of course, and what does that one entail, no pun intended? Yeah, there's lots of videos online that people can look up for themselves. But essentially what we're talking about here is you put a cat in a box with something that can randomly kill it. A radioactive substance that has a 50-50 chance of decaying or not. No external influence is allowed. So the idea is that once the cat is in that box, until you open it, it's both dead and alive. If you leave the box closed, the cat will forever remain in a state of being alive and dead at the same time. Only by opening that box do you force the result into existence. By observing it, you make it into reality. Interesting. So how does this pertain to your invention? Well, the idea was simple. I wanted to make a Schrodinger's cat experiment and flip it on its head. I wanted to see what the cat sees when it's sitting inside that box. According to this theory, when the cat is in the box, it's essentially a waveform. It hovers between states. I'm being terribly reductive here, and I'm sure my colleagues will have a fit once they read this article. But I'm trying to explain this in a way that people will understand. So that people can get a breakthrough where this invention is. So you're saying you've done it? You've created something that allows you to observe the things that aren't meant to be observed? Because according to quantum mechanics... It is our experience of these things that causes them to immediately solidify into reality. By looking at them, aren't you disturbing that? We found a way around it. Come on, I'll show you. The four of us got up to follow Garrett. I am accompanied by my photographer, Ramon, who has generously offered his time to assist with this story. Also with us is Garrett's lab assistant, Carrie. She's a specialist in quantum computing and has a host of credentials that tell me she is not new to this field. The CEO has managed to pick some of the best and brightest from the quantum computing and research companies. Carrie's a perfect example of this, and she could easily work anywhere she likes. We make our way out of Garrett's modest office, and he leads us down the hallway towards Proteon's laboratory and warehouse space. The company is still in its infancy, according to Garrett, as the place is clearly a low-budget operation for the time being. All the capital they have is being poured into one thing. The experiment. The Magic Tour Bus, as they've come to call it. Garrett hates that name, and I only hear of it because the receptionist tells me that's what the project has been known as, to the various low-level employees not privileged enough to take part in its creation. There are very few staff members walking the halls, I notice, until we arrive at the laboratory in the warehouse section where they keep the giant, inconceivably expensive experiment. Garrett shows us into the huge workspace, and the four of us stand marveling at the enormous black tour bus. The windows are completely dark, and show nothing of what is inside. It looks like the decked-out ride of a famous rock group, or maybe a politician. Dozens of employees appear to be just finishing loading the bus. They have loaded the back and top of the bus with stacks of enormous water jugs and fuel canisters. Inside the cargo holds, I see several large crates marked MRE and also what appear to be tents, blankets, cold weather gear, and various other supplies. Well, here it is. It looks like more or less an ordinary tour bus to me, except packed to the gills. What are we doing here, going on safari? <laughs> I just like to be prepared. It must be the Boy Scout in me. Come on, I'll show you what it looks like in there. Are you ready to be a Schrodinger's cat? Just kidding, it's completely safe. So the idea here is we're going to be going for a little drive, correct? To see the experiment in action, you have to be on the bus and moving? Uh, that's correct. Not only that, but we have to be outside of anyone's observation. At least an hour, maybe more. Sounds easy, right? Well, you'll be surprised. There are people everywhere. We're going to have to get pretty far away from the city. And we can't just sit somewhere. We're going to have to be moving at a decent speed if we want this thing to work. Okay, sounds a little far-fetched to me, if I'm being honest. 
What are we supposed to see once we get there? Is everything going to turn into a waveform? Well, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect the first time. Uh, we've gone out now more than once, and it's never gone the same way twice. Let's just say you're going to be in for a hell of a ride. Okay, sounds interesting, if nothing else. I'm ready when you are. Good, good. And you've signed the forms, correct? Uh, what, what forms? At this point, we stop the interview as Garrett seems to realize we never signed some legal documents that his assistant was apparently supposed to have us agree to. I tell him I had never heard anything like that. Garrett hastily pulls out some documents from a nearby filing cabinet and gets us to look them over, saying not to rush. I feel like I can't help but rush, though, as the sheaf of papers he has given us is at least 100 pages long, and he seems like he's in a hurry. As the CEO of a tech company, he's already made it clear that we're lucky to be having this interview, since he has a lot on his plate. We attempt to interpret the contract as thoroughly as possible, given the time constraints, but find most of it is in legalese. I sign the papers, gently admonishing the man for thrusting this on us at the last second. Ramon does the same. Perfect! Now we can get the show on the road. We're suddenly being ushered along quickly into the bus, where we find a couple other people waiting inside. They introduce themselves as Ted and Wayne, and they say they're journalists as well, for a news outlet that I have never heard of. So much for my exclusive. The men are both approximately six and a half feet tall, well-built, with chiseled features. They speak to us briefly before Garrett joins us on the bus, followed by Carrie. The bus is enclosed at the back from the driver, who is in a separate box, it seems. The windows and windshield are also tinted and impossible to see through from the outside. I'm not surprised at what is happening, since this was all arranged ahead of time, but the suddenness of it and the extensive legal paperwork being thrust at us is a bit jarring, I'll admit, despite my desire for journalistic neutrality. I try to clear my mind of preconceptions and remind myself that this man is indisputably a genius, as he stands in the center of the aisle near the front and begins to give us a quick talk before departure. Okay, everyone, I have a few rules for these expeditions, which you'll understand once we get out there. I'm going to go over them now. Take notes if you like, but whatever you do, don't forget what I'm telling you right now. Rule number one. Don't get off the bus unless you get direct permission from me. No exceptions. Rule number two. Whatever you see out there, don't try to make contact. Don't bang on the glass or try to draw attention to us. Rule number three. Once we're off the bus, you need to follow my instructions at all times. No hesitation. And that's it. So with that, we'll close the doors and turn ourselves into a litter of Schrodinger's cats. The doors of the bus swing closed, and with that, we're heading out the garage doors towards the street. Garrett takes a seat near the front of the bus with his assistant, Carrie, at his side. I decide this might be a good time to interview the other members of our traveling party while we make the long journey out to the forested wilderness. I approach Ted and Wayne, who are sitting together at the back of the bus. Taking a seat across the aisle from them, I try to brace myself for what I'm about to do. Asking tough questions is the really difficult part of being a journalist. But it's part of the job. So, guys, can you stop lying and tell me the truth, now that we're committed to this thing? They look at each other, then up to the front of the bus where Garrett is sitting. He's talking with Carrie, not paying much attention to us at all. What are you talking about? Look, I, I saw your faces when we were getting ready to leave. You were both terrified out of your wits when that bus door closed. You're nuts, man. Who's this guy, anyways? I'm a Schrodinger's cat, just like you. Remember? Garrett said so himself. Now, I get a very strong suspicion that this thing isn't nearly as safe as he claimed it was, and that you both might know something about that. Care to comment, fellow journalists? By the way, is that gun on your waistband standard issue for all writers at your magazine? Maybe you should mind your own business. Go back to your seat, asshole. I can feel the back of my neck get hot as I turn around and walk back up front. The interview's not going as planned. Ramon is looking at me uneasily, and I try to give him a brave smile. We spend the next two hours driving in silence, as we finally get free of all the other cars and traffic on the road. Garrett has a route designed for this purpose which is exceptionally quiet. We take another turn, and it leads into the wilderness of a deep and ancient forest where no other cars seem to travel. A long stretch of nothingness goes by, and I spend my time pretending to look out the window, but secretly watching Ted and Wayne. They keep a low profile, barely speaking to one another, 
except for the occasional hushed whisper. I realized that Garrett exaggerated when he said it would be a couple of hours before the event we would be observing took place. It had already been nearly four hours by my count. The trees outside look ordinary, with no indication that any change has occurred, despite our apparent lack of observation from the outside world for quite some time. Just as I'm beginning to think this is perhaps a hoax after all, we see it. We come over a rise, and there it is. A massive oak tree standing in the middle of the road. It rises up like a monolith, as the landscape ahead comes into view. Its branches are in the clouds. Ah, there it is, everyone. The gateway tree. The bus is full of murmuring and surprised whispers as we stare in awe. It's the size of a skyscraper. No, much, much larger than that. Its branches extending into the heavens out of sight into the sky, like dark and living lightning bolts. It takes a long time to arrive at the tree as it seems to come into focus very gradually, like a great city off in the distance. The black hole between winding trunk roots gets bigger and bigger as we approach what I finally come to realize is a huge tunnel going into the tree. We go through and are plunged into blackness. The darkness lasts for a long time, and the murmurs and whispers in the bus turn to gasps and sharp yells of terror, as all the lights seem to have suddenly evaporated from the world, leaving us in utter and complete pitch blackness. My heartbeat begins to quicken in my chest and I feel Ramon grab my arm. He's praying in Spanish. Then I hear a faint pop as the sun hits my eyes again. We come out and through the other side of the giant tree trunk. We continue into the endless woods on the other side of the great oak tree, and Ramon and I try to calm ourselves from the strange experience of going through it. I see the trees around us have grown twisted, evil, and alien-looking, and the sky above is a bruised purple color. The bus begins to slow down and something catches my eye to the right. Everyone else seems to be caught up with something on the left side of the bus, and they are up from their seats, moving towards the windows on that side, gasping at what they see there but I am transfixed by something on the other side where I'm sitting, something a little ways off in the woods. There are figures moving through the trees, I notice. Many of them. Hundreds, I think, at first. Then realize it is far, far more than that. The figures turn their heads, and I realize they have stopped abruptly what they are doing, and are focused as a group completely on us. No one else on the bus seems to have taken notice of them, they begin to cluster around in an insectile fashion, and I realize with sudden panic that the driver has pulled over, that we are no longer moving. I'd been so focused on the figures in the woods I hadn't noticed the bus stop. I suddenly find myself incapable of speech as terror grips me like I've never felt before. The figures move in organized fashion, keeping to the shadows of the malformed trees, the closest ones now sidling up to the bus. As I fumble for words and tremble with fear, Garrett heads to the middle of the aisle and speaks up in a proud and unconcerned voice. Welcome to the world beyond, everyone. I'll get right to the next part of the email. I hope you're beginning to see now why I'm worried about my cousin Carrie. The worst part of it all, for me at least, is that none of this brings me any closer to finding her just leads me to more questions without answers. Maybe someone out there will have more luck deciphering the clues contained in these emails. I feel like there's something I'm not seeing. The Observers, Part 2, May 2020. Garrett is saying something about the waterfall feature to the left of the bus, and I finally managed to form some words to try to get his attention. Outside! They're outside! Lots of them! Everyone else has gathered on the other side of the bus and are looking out the windows and listening to Garrett speak. When I start to call out, they turn around and look back my way with widening eyes into the trees, as we begin to hear the footfalls of many people moving outside. I look down at my window and see the shapes are not coming into focus any more clearly, despite the fact that they are only a few feet away. They seem to remain as dark as shadow forms, with no discernible features. They begin to climb up onto the back and sides of the bus, poking at the tires with long spears, drowning out the sunlight with their light-absorbing bodies. The effect is terrifying, like being plunged into unexpected darkness going through a tunnel on a water slide. 
Hang on to something. Full throttle forward. The bus accelerates rapidly, and I'm thrown backwards in my seat as the trees begin to speed past us again. Shadowy forms fall off the bus one by one, being ripped away by the wind. It seems like they almost have no weight to them, as they flutter like leaves and drift off into the sky. The sun is finally shining through, and they seem to have all fallen off the bus after a minute or two of driving. I look back to see the horde of shadow creatures still standing in the roadway behind us, their faces watching us as they get smaller in the distance. What the hell were those things? I have no idea. You'll find there are all sorts of things on this side of the giant oak tree that don't make much sense. But that's the fun of it. Don't worry, you're safe. This bus is totally impenetrable. How do you know that? If what's on this side is beyond anything we've experienced, how could you possibly know that? We're in another dimension, correct? So... So, they might not play by the same rules over here. So far, we've found all the realms play by the same fundamental laws of physics. Not only that, but they've all had breathable air and quite hospitable environments. It would appear that Earth is a haven for organic life, no matter which reality you experience it in. At least from what you've seen up until this point. That's correct. There's one other thing that's been the same in nearly every instance, and that's that there's intelligent creatures similar to humans in most of these realms. We've conversed with several of them. You made contact? You actually spoke to a creature from another dimension? Indeed I did. And in English. Just last week, in fact. There was a city about 80 miles from our relative location. I'd like to see if there's something like that here in this reality as well. That was the first one of its kind we found. A city? Holy shit. Uh, yeah, there's no guarantee we'll find the same in this place, but... It's not so far to go. It's worth taking a look, don't you think? I, I guess I'm up for the challenge. This is an experience of a lifetime, after all. Just promise me that if, if things start to go south, we'll turn around and we'll get out of here. Deal. I'm glad you're here, Nasir. I think it's time the world found out about this. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I need to speak with Carrie about something. He went back to the front of the bus where he sat down next to his lab assistant. My photographer, Ramon, came back over and sat down next to me. He had gotten up to look at the waterfall on the other side of the bus before the shadow people had appeared. I noticed his face was pale and he was trembling. Are you okay, Ramon? You don't look so good. I took some pictures of the waterfall back there. I was just looking through them and... I think you need to see this. What is it? Ramon proceeds to show me the viewfinder of his camera. The screen displays a large waterfall, towering into the heights above. Not a great photo since it was taken through a window, but then he zooms in and I see why he was so afraid. There's a large form standing in the trees watching the bus. It's different from the shadow creatures on the other side and blends in well with the foliage. It looks like a huge man with the body of a tree. His massive face had a beard made of moss, and he looks acutely aware of the fact that we do not belong here. His arms are crossed, his brow furrowed in concern. Whoa. Okay, yeah, I can see why you're a bit shaken up. That thing's huge. It's, it's almost invisible in the trees. Yes, we were looking right at it and didn't notice it. Should we show it to Garrett? Perhaps it's important. It might be worth mentioning. Especially considering the fact that we're surrounded by trees. He seems a bit preoccupied at the moment, though. What did he say to you, anyways? He told me he's spoken to the creatures in other dimensions. He's made contact. He said he talked to one last week in a city in a different world. A different world than the one we're in right now. It even spoke English, apparently. We're headed in that direction now. He wants to see if there's something like that here as well. Well, if there is, to be honest, I'm not sure I want to see it. Those shadow things back there, they didn't seem happy with us being here. Even the trees look angry. And that tree person, eh, he definitely wasn't happy to see us. What tree person? He sneaks up on us quietly without us realizing it. He looks at us with his steel blue eyes and appears completely confident, as if it is his job to look after our safety. I suddenly get a feeling what this man's real occupation is. 
he and Wayne had claimed to be journalists. I realize now they might be our protectors. I probably shouldn't have pissed them off earlier. I decide it may be in our best interest to share the information with these men. It doesn't make sense to continue the pattern of lying. Maybe some honesty will have a positive impact. Take a look for yourself. What the hell's going on? They were trying to hide this. Some creature in the woods. I overheard him talking about it. We weren't hiding anything. I just finished saying we should share this information with Garrett. Yeah, sure you were. Hey, Garrett, we got a situation. He takes the camera and stalks off to the front of the bus. Ramon is about to say something about how it's his equipment and the man is walking away with, but I stop him. I'm suddenly picturing a Lord of the Flies situation developing here. I don't like the team dynamics that are being cultivated at such an early stage in our journey. Ramon mentions to me that it's probably a good idea if we go up and talk to Garrett as well. If we don't, then it will only be a one-sided story. And coming from Ted, that could be trouble. You guys weren't planning to share this with the rest of the class? We were, Garrett. Ramon was just showing it to me a few seconds ago. We hadn't had a chance to show it to you yet. Uh, but you were planning on showing it. Of course. You're the expert here. We're just along for the ride. All right. We'll have to be careful. This means not all of these trees are simply trees. Some may be able to ambulate and, and do quite a bit of damage, judging by the size of this one. Good job catching it on film, Ramon. Uh, can I have a copy of that picture, please? Yeah, no problem. Can I have my camera back now? Garrett nods at Ted, who hands it back to him. Garrett is still sitting in his seat with a small, bemused grin. He doesn't seem worried at all. He reminds me of an Elon Musk or Steve Jobs type. One of those billionaire tech CEOs who don't seem the least bit concerned with the problems of us mortals. The bus suddenly begins to stop and we are thrown forward. Ramon and I end up tumbling into the front of the bus and I bang hard against the glass with my neck and shoulder. Ramon lands upside down on the stairs leading to the door. I see he's bleeding from a head wound when he looks up at me. We're unable to see the front of the bus because of the tinted glass, but that changes a moment later when Garrett calls out to the voice-activated technology. Display front window. Suddenly it appears as if the entire driver's compartment has disappeared. We look out at a perfect video image of the front of the bus. He had done this before when we were nearing the huge tree that divided the realities, but it was still amazing to me. The image is a flawless picture, and it looks like we're staring out into the open air in front of the bus from the perspective of the front windshield. The technology is one of a kind, as far as I can tell. There are several trees blocking the road. The gravel laneway can be seen extending beyond them, but three huge oaks are now rooted there, blocking the way. The trunks of them are unusual looking, and appear to have malformed faces barely visible in the organic grooves and turns of the bark. They look dissimilar from the tree man in Ramon's picture, though. The bus idles silently while we wait to see what Garrett will do. He looks to the right and says something into the walkie-talkie. The bus begins to turn sharply in that direction, the tires crunching the gravel road as the wheels make the dry turn. We start moving again and I see what Garrett is looking at. There is a narrow dirt road that is leading into the forest to our right. It takes us down a very steep hill. What are you doing? That hill's way too much of an incline for us to get back out if the road's a dead end. We gotta turn back. It'll be fine. The trees and engine on this bus are far superior to anything you're familiar with. If there's no way around this roadblock down that side road, we'll turn around and go back, okay? The way he says it doesn't offer much chance for argument. I wordlessly go back to my seat as the bus suddenly takes an alarming dip down the embankment. The woods outside become steadily darker and block out almost all of the sun's rays as we begin to descend towards the floor of what appears to be a wooded valley. The bus begins to pick up speed again, and soon we are traveling very, very quickly. The trees blur to the sides of the bus as they go by. I don't like this. I don't either. He's got a weird look in his eyes, doesn't he? Like he doesn't seem worried out here at all. I don't know how many times I'd have to do this to not be freaked out by the fact that we're Traveling through another dimension right now, by the looks of it. He's taking numerous pictures as we go, rapidly filling up a large SD card that's in the camera. He tells me he has several spares and is not worried about running out of space. Good news, considering we still have a ways to go at this rate. Pictures of the city would be highly interesting and more than newsworthy if we could get them. 
Ramon, are you sure you're okay with this? I know you're a pro and everything, but this is getting a little out of hand. Just say the word, and I'll tell him we want to go back. Well, we've already come this far. Let's see where this madness leads. Okay, just tell me if you start to change your mind. The road through the dark forest extends for a while, and I use the opportunity to type up my notes. As I do so, I notice that the time on my laptop is no longer running at normal speed. The minutes pass by in roughly the span of 100 seconds, I realize, after counting for myself. I mention this to Ramon, and he's initially shocked, insisting that I show it to him so he can see for himself. After witnessing it, he remains silent for a minute or two, as if in thought, then seems to make peace with the strangeness of it. He says it tracks for how weird everything else is on this side of the oak tree. The path ahead is bumpy, but the bus handles it beautifully, and it feels like we're riding on air as we continue through the trees. The road never bends, but continues straight as an arrow for as far as the eye can see. After driving for what feels like hours, we see a structure up ahead. It is a quaint little house, painted black. Smoke rises from the chimney, and as we approach I see there is a figure standing out front waiting to greet us. It appears to be an old woman, dressed in a black funeral dress. that looks like it's from the Victorian era. Or whatever the equivalent is of that in this world. A dark veil covers her face. The bus stops a little ways away from her, and she remains stock still, staring at us. The sight of her terrifies me. I don't know what it is, whether it's her hands, far too pale, that appear to be holding a small bag in front of her, or if it's not knowing what is beneath that veil. What horrors. She begins to walk towards us. Garrett, we need to get out of here. Back up the bus, please. I'm begging you. Hang on, she's trying to make contact. You said we could leave if we asked. If it felt like we were in danger. I feel like we're in danger right now. Can we please get out of here? I don't like this. Let's just see what she does. She can't get in. As he says those words, the doors at the front of the bus open, and the smell of foreign air comes wafting in. With it, the odors of rotting vegetation and something else. Rotten and infected. The woman in the pitch-black funeral dress enters the bus. I see Garrett's jaw is agape, and clearly he did not authorize her entry. It is the first time his calm demeanor has broken during the entire journey. How? Close doors! Close doors! Close the fucking doors! Now! I look to the right and see the entire horde of shadow creatures is approaching from the right side of the bus. They have followed us here and are closing in quickly. I look around for anything to use as a weapon. I'm so distracted by this new terror... I hardly notice the woman in black is now walking down the aisle towards me. She stands over me, looking down. I can barely make out the features of her face, seeing the outlines of a dark visage that should not, could not be. There are worms moving in and out of her eye sockets. Her nose is gone, and only two dark holes are there where it should be. You should not have followed him here. I... Uh, I'm sorry. We didn't know. I'm so sorry. Garrett is screaming at the driver to reverse, full speed, and the bus suddenly accelerates backwards. The door at the front of the bus is still open, and the shadow people are closing in on that side. My heart is pounding, and I hear Ramon praying in Spanish again beside me. I think it's a Hail Mary. The horde is coming. The city. Take me. The woman in black seems to be speaking to Garrett, but he isn't paying attention. I agree for him and beg her to take a seat away from me. Far, far away from me. I try not to be rude about it, but the smell of her is horrible. Like month-old rotting flesh on a hundred degree day. Thankfully, she moves away from me and takes a seat near the front. Garrett gets up to his feet and walks over to her. I see him talking quietly to her for a minute and then he nods and she nods back at him. Then he walks to the front of the bus and begins to speak to us all again. The bus is still flying backwards, and I can't understand how he's walking around and standing there with the constant jostling movement. Okay, everyone, looks like we have a guest with us for our trip into the city. She said she's going to be our guide, and she says she can get us through those trees. So let's be nice to this, uh, lady who's going to help us out, all right? 
He smiles broadly at me, and I look back to see Tom and Wayne are sitting there with wide eyes, staring alternately out the window with the horde of shadow creatures, who have just barely escaped, and at the woman in black, who is now humming an off-key tune from where she sits. I suddenly get the feeling that they were not aware of the potential horrors we would be facing here. The sickening smell of the woman in black is now permeating the bus, making everything stink like death and rotting flesh. The soft, off-key humming continues, and I grow more and more terrified with every passing second that she remains in the bus with us. Whatever that woman is, she is not going into the city to help anyone. I am completely certain of that. Hey everybody, it's me again. I won't take up too much of your time before getting to the next part of the mystery emails. I'm still hopeful that my cousin Carrie is okay, but I've read through these next few parts and things are definitely starting to sound more and more dangerous with the dead woman aboard the magic tour bus. Despite my constant phone calls, emails, and persistent internet searches, I'm no closer to finding her than when I started posting these but I can still hold out hope that maybe somehow this will help. Maybe someone will see this and will know what the hell is going on. The Observers, first draft, May 2020. The smell of decay emanating from the woman sitting in front of us is overwhelming, and Ramon and I quickly stand up and change seats to get away from it, moving towards the front of the bus to sit closer to Carrie and Garrett. He had said that he wanted privacy for the early stages of the trip so that he could calibrate equipment as necessary and make any adjustments that were needed. But he seems to be doing nothing except sitting and talking to Carrie, his lab assistant. Any adjustments are being made by her using a large tablet device that she's holding. The bus controls are also voice operated as we witnessed earlier. We walk up the aisle of the bus as it glides quickly down the road on its immaculate suspension system. The lack of bumps and jostling despite the rough terrain is surreal. It's the next thing I plan to ask Garrett about. You shouldn't trust him, you know. He isn't who he says he is. Ramon and I look back at the woman in black, seeing again the worms crawling in and out of her face through the sheer black veil she's wearing. I realize what the smell reminds me of suddenly. My family owns a cabin. It's just a little shack in the woods, but it sits at the end of a peninsula that we have all to ourselves, so it's quite pleasant and peaceful up there. One year I went up and discovered a horrible stink permeating the place. We couldn't figure out what it was despite our efforts to discover the source of it. By the second day we were desperate, searching everywhere to try and find what rotten food someone had left behind or what could possibly cause such an odor. Then we found it hiding in the bottom of a steel bucket in the corner of the kitchen, deep in the shadows beneath the counter. A mouse had fallen into the bucket and died, unable to escape, and its corpse had begun to rot. I realized then what the smell was coming off the woman in black, and why it was such a relief to finally get away from the sickly sweetness of it. It was the stink of death. That is what the odor wafting from the woman in black reminds me of only a hundred times worse. After a quick look back, we continued towards the front of the bus, unsure what to say or how to respond to her. Don't talk to her. It's better if we just ignore her. Clearly, she has some supernatural abilities if she was able to override our security systems and come aboard the bus. It would appear that way. She said not to trust you, Garrett. That you aren't who you say you are. Is there something to that? Since she's got these supernatural abilities, maybe she can sense things that we aren't able to discern. I'm sure my lab assistant and other colleagues can vouch for my identity. She is clearly not a good being, whatever she is. Hence why my instructions were to resist the urge to speak to her or listen to anything she says. We're making good progress on our return trajectory, Carrie said. If all goes well, we should be on target to reach the city with only a 4.5 hour time dilation. Time dilation? What does that mean exactly? Garrett shoots Carrie a look and she turns red in the face for a second as if caught in a lie. It just means we're delayed slightly. We'll need to adjust our schedule, that's all. I see. 
Now, I was wondering if it would be alright to ask you a few more questions, since we seem to have a bit of time on our hands right now. I don't see why not. Go right ahead. Regarding these other expeditions you've made into the parallel worlds, what exactly have you seen? And how do you know it's safe before you go through? If there are infinite dimensions, I would assume that the majority of them are uninhabitable. You would think that, but you would be wrong. As I said before, each time we go through, we find the version of Earth on the other side is just as welcoming and nurturing of human life as it is in our world. Regardless, we run a number of calculations before venturing through. The bus is so sophisticated that it will stop on a dime. Go into reverse if it detects that the world being entered is not suitable. But that hasn't happened yet. Maybe we've just gotten lucky so far. On the inside, I'm an emotional wreck, but the journalist in me is insisting that this is a once-in-a-lifetime story. So I catch myself acting like this is just another interview, even though it's anything but. Maybe I'm just trying to distract myself from the surreal facts which surround us. The dead woman sitting on the bus five rows back. The horde of shadow people following us. The trees in the forest and the fact that they are alive and watching us. Clearly capable of intelligent thought and locomotion. Not to mention the whole fact that we're in a different dimension. That's a bit of a weird one to wrap my head around. So, Garrett, are you excited now that this project is finally going to see the light of day? You must be, after all your years of hard work. Excited is perhaps not the best word for it. I feel justified, in a way. Like all of the money and effort I put into this has not been in vain. That would be difficult, if not impossible, for me to wrap my head around. There is a secret way through the trees, if you wish to take it. The woman in black said. To bring us to the city faster. To them. Her voice is dry and empty, but impossible to ignore. I know they will listen to her somehow before they say anything. It is imperative that they make up the lost time, I realize, with increasing alarm. The time dilation comment and the way Garrett looked at Carrie when she mentioned it makes it obvious. I see no road intersecting this one. Are you sure? Slow down. I will show you. She stands up and I see maggots and worms fall to the ground like crumbs from the lap of a sloppy eater. Only these crumbs lay in the aisle and all over the floor, squirming. Her steps are slow and purposeful as she approaches the front of the bus and the smell of her overwhelms me once again. I see her wave her hand and the door at the front opens up again and Garrett calls for the driver to stop. The woman gets off the bus, and as she stands by the side of the road, I see the vegetation around her die immediately as she approaches it. The grass turns yellow, then brown, then black. The trees begin to wither and deform, and they shrink back from her as if in fear. Her bony hands make hypnotic dancing motions that make my eyelids heavy to look at, and the grass and dead leaves open up to reveal a dirt road which has been covered over by growth. Beneath her veil I can see her smiling at the death and destruction she has wrought. Outside the bus, everything nearby now appears dead and rotten, and I am suddenly that much more afraid to be near this woman. If she can do that to grass and trees with just her presence, what is she doing to us by being near us? I get the feeling that smelling her B.O. was about a million times worse than any secondhand smoke. Looking at Ramon, I can tell he's having the same thought. He lifts his shirt up over his face to cover his nose, and his eyes are full of fear and tears. What is she? The woman joins us on the bus again, and the dead smell follows her. She sits down slightly closer to us this time, and I hate her for it. Within a few minutes, I find myself standing up and going to the back of the bus to try to get away from that stink, despite the fact that I also don't like being around Ted and Wayne. At the very back of the bus, I find myself relieved to be in somewhat fresher air and I turn on the little fan above me. Wishing that I could open a window, I close my eyes and try to think of the outdoors. The outdoors on Earth. Following the right turn onto the road the witch woman had uncovered, we begin gradually leaving the depths of the forest. Occasional glades and fields come into view, and eventually we are free from the constant shroud of shadow that accompanied the woods. Ah, finally, out of the forest! If my calculations are correct, the road which intersects this one will take us to the city. Whatever version of that we find here will be interesting to see. Garrett seems oddly unbothered by the smell. 
Despite my concerns, I feel powerless to stop our progress as the bus makes its way towards the road that will take us into this dark dimension's capital. I look out the back window and see in the distance the forest disappearing behind us. Like a colony of ants, the shadow people emerge and pour out of the trees, pursuing us. No matter how fast we are, they are just behind us. On our heels, like our very own shadows. The emails are still coming in. Here's the next part of the strange voyage of the magic tour bus. I'm holding out hope that one of these will tell me something about what happened to my cousin Carrie. Please don't judge her too harshly based on this post. She's not usually like this. At least she wasn't before. Anyways, here goes. The Observers, First Draft, May 2020. As the forest disappears in the distance behind us, I try to build up the courage to talk to Garrett again. Like I said before, asking tough questions is the hardest part of being a reporter. But I have a feeling, and I want to follow up on it. Need to follow up on it. Ramon sees me squirming in my seat like a little kid as I debate whether to go through with it. You, uh, need to take a dump or something, boss? I wish. There's something not sitting right with me. And it's not those MREs he's been feeding us. This doesn't all add up. I stand up and start moving. Making my way past the deathly sweet stink of the dead woman, I take a seat across the aisle from Garrett and Carrie. Ramon follows behind, skirting around the dead woman as widely as possible. There's one thing I don't understand about all this, I say to Garrett. Just one? Okay, one major thing. A bunch of other stuff too, obviously, but here it is. If we're basing all of this on the famous Schrodinger's cat experiment, only reversed, doesn't that mean the bus would need some deadly hazard inside, like, like the decaying isotope in the original experiment? How is this working if there isn't a 50-50 chance of us dying upon entering the bus? I mean, that's the whole point, right? Garrett whispers something to Carrie and I feel my heart skip a beat. Why do I feel so utterly full of dread suddenly? Well, the thing is... He stumbles over his words and I realize this is the first time since I met the man that he doesn't appear overly confident and disarming with his speech. He pauses and seems to be having trouble figuring out what to say. Okay, don't get mad. I mean, I'm sure you're gonna be, but just remember it's done now and you're both okay, so no harm done, right? I still don't understand. What are you talking about? Well, like you said yourself, the experiment doesn't work unless you're 50-50. Dead or alive. So you're saying this bus is actually a Schrodinger's box? A 50-50 game of Russian roulette? I'm saying you're alive, but there was a chance, a 50-50 chance, eh, you would have died when the door closed back in the garage. There's a mechanism built into the bus. It would have been quick and painless, though, I assure you. That's attempted murder! Hardly. I told you the risks before we got on the bus. You agreed to everything. You waived all your rights to pursue legal action following this, just so you're aware. I don't care what the hell that contract said. This is illegal. You're bringing us back right now. This is insane. Ramon is yelling at him as well. And when Garrett turns around to tell him to sit down and shut up, Ramon loses it. He lunges at Garrett and attacks him. I see Ted and Wayne have appeared seemingly from thin air, and I understand now why Garrett was taking so long to explain everything. It was his way of giving them time to approach quietly from behind us. Wayne grabs me from behind, and Ted goes to pull Ramon away from Garrett before he can hurt him. But it's too late. Ramon slips away, and I can see his hands are going for the CEO's neck. But instead of choking the man, he falls tumbling forward off balance. Garrett's body flickers and comes into focus again, with Ramon's arms through his neck as if he were a phantom. A ghost. Suddenly I understand. The son of a bitch isn't there at all. He's just a projection. His image is an extremely well-rendered hologram, probably ever since we stepped onto the bus, or even before that. This is just a digital body double, a very well-rendered one. I hadn't been able to detect the difference this entire time. I look at Carrie in disbelief. 
Clearly Ted and Wayne are real, which explains why they winced when the bus door closed back in the garage. They knew that it was possible they could die in that second, but I wasn't sure about her. Was she a hologram as well? She touched my arm as if she had read my mind. Unlike her boss, she was there for real. I'm here. We're in this together, okay? I'm still in shock and for a few seconds unable to speak. The fact that Garrett has tricked us into coming here under false pretenses, and that we nearly died is almost too much to contemplate. All I want to do is go back home. The hell we are. You knew what the risks were. You knew what you were signing up for. We didn't even have time to read those damn contracts, and you both knew it. I'm sorry, but what's done is done. Let's finish out this trip and go back. The article you write about and the photos that your colleague is taking will make you rich and famous. I can guarantee it. You think we care about that? We just want to go home. We've had enough of this freak show. Your boss almost got us killed, and we're not going to just forget about that like it didn't happen. Her face suddenly becomes cold, and I realize she's not on our side at all. We are merely observers on this experiment. And she tells us that a second later. You are not to disrupt this endeavor, understand? Once we return home, you will be able to contact whatever law enforcement you wish, and can press whatever charges you like. Good luck finding something in the penal code that covers this, though. That's all I'm saying. Ted and Wayne drag us back to the rear of the bus, and beneath the veil I can see the woman in black smiling with her rotten teeth, and worm companions poking from the holes in her face where dimples would be. I told you he wasn't who he said he was. Smoke and mirrors, ones and zeros. The fact that her disturbing features are partially hidden by her black veil make them somehow even more terrifying. I feel my heartbeat quicken with fear every time I look in her direction. After dragging us against our will to the back of the bus, the two men separate us and put us in the window seats on either side of the aisle. Ted, whose face I find more and more obnoxious with each passing second, is blocking me into my seat now at the back of the bus as I type up these notes. Time is steadily passing, and I see we've been driving all day. The sky is beginning to darken, and far off in the distance I see a phenomenon in the sky, like you would see on Earth above a large city at night when approaching from a distance. It reminds me of the glow you sometimes see reflected in the clouds when driving towards a metropolis on the highway. Only this glow is in reverse, a giant bruise on the already dark sky above. Judging by the size of the glowing reflection in the clouds, it would appear that the city, if that is what it is, that we are approaching is quite massive. After several more hours riding in awkward silence, the vague outlines of shadowy buildings come into view. The city stretches out in front of us like Manhattan, impressive and looming. Driving towards it takes forever as it gradually comes into focus. The world around us is dark, but we are plunged into total blackness as the town envelops us. Night vision. Suddenly the windows of the bus are illuminated with different shades of green, and we can see figures lining the road on either side of us. They are standing in two perfect rows on either side, like a welcoming parade. The shapes of them are perfectly spaced apart, their faces blank and observing us with no emotion as we drive through their midst. Up ahead I see the tallest building of them all at the center of the Shadow City. Giant letters are illuminated in green through the night vision technology. The building has a huge sign which blinks on and off, beckoning us closer. It is a skyscraper larger than any I have seen before. The blinking sign mocks me as I stare at it and Garrett turns around and smiles when he sees the expression on my face. Proteon Corporation, it reads. Told you we made contact. This looks like it might be the last email from Nazir, or whoever the hell was sending these. I'm no closer to finding Carrie after all of this, but it does potentially answer the question of where she has disappeared to. At this rate, I don't know if I'll ever see her again. She wanted to devote her life to science. Well, it would appear that that is what she has done, even if it's not the most wholesome science. Quite the opposite, in fact. I know she wanted to change the world. It looks like she got her wish. I just really wish she decided to change it for the better. The Observer's First Draft, May 2020.
We are swallowed up by the enormous black building, the sign atop reading Proteon. As the bus drives further into the underground garage, I see that the place is bustling with activity. There are thousands of shadow people moving to and fro, performing various functions. Talking to Garrett is difficult from the back of the bus. I raise my voice so that he can hear me. What the hell is this place, Garrett? Why did you bring us here? Uh, this is the headquarters of Proteon Corporation, my friends. I don't understand. I thought that's where we came from. Uh, but this is the mirror image of it. The opposite of our world of light. This is the Shadow Realm. The Forest of Decay separates the two. The forest will not let you leave once you enter it, if you try to cross over from the other realm. Unless, of course, you are able to obtain assistance. Assistance at a price. Everything with a price. Of course, can't forget that. The toll. And what exactly is the cost for this voyage to the other side? My mouth is dry as I ask the question. I already know the answer before he says it. All in good time, my friend, all in good time. Ah, here's the elevator. The bus drives into an enormous elevator, and after the doors close behind us, I can feel it rising up. Finally, after a few minutes, we reach the top floor, and the door opens up again in front of us. The bus exits the giant elevator, and I see we are in a huge room with windows on all sides. We are on the top floor of Proteon Headquarters. All right, everybody off the bus. My heart begins to pound faster and faster. Without the night vision windows on the bus, everything will be pitch black and terrifying out there. Ted and Wayne pull us to our feet and we are shoved out the door at the front of the bus. Darkness envelops us and I can see nothing. Even my hand in front of my face doesn't register. Ted and Wayne are sounding scared, and I realize they've never done this before. They have never been to this place of shadow and infinite darkness. Garrett's voice booms from above us, and I feel disoriented immediately, having no idea where he is standing. Is it the real Garrett or the hologram? He answers my question when he appears in front of me, illuminated by blue light which seems to radiate from inside of him. He floats over to me on the air itself, and I see his eyes are glowing intensely as he stares at me. Why do you look so scared, Nazir? Are you afraid your interview will never see the light of day? That it will die in this world of shadow? In the eerie blue light, I can see that if he was once a man, he is no longer that. This is something else entirely now. The hologram is gone. A creature hovers in the air, half human and half dark necromantic sorcerer, born of black magic and twisted science. You tried so hard to keep up, to write your article as all the madness occurred around us. And yet here we are, Nazir, at the end. And despite all your hard work, nothing to show for it. No Pulitzer, no publication. But hey, I'm feeling generous. I'll tell you what. I'll let you have your article. Carrie can bring it back to Earth with her. I can't go back there now, not after what I've become. But Carrie will, won't you, dear? I can barely see her nod in the dim blue light cast by the eerie glow of the CEO's internal power source. Whatever you wish. It doesn't matter anymore what happens in that realm. We can recruit from others. Where do you want me to send it? Newsweek? Time Magazine? Somewhere less noticeable, just in case we need to go back there for some reason. You can decide. I have a cousin who likes to post on Reddit No Sleep. I can send it to him. It'll probably just die in new. Perfect. Go ahead, Nazir. Finish typing it up. And we'll be sure to send it back with her. Any more questions you'd like to ask before she leaves? What will happen to us? What's he going to do to us? I'd prefer not to know. The woman in black has been working with him. This city was nothing more than a tiny village once. Now look at it. He needs recruits. People to perform the various tasks and functions to keep this place running. He makes me bring them over from Earth, and then they stay here. They become part of the Shadow World. That's all I really know. But why? To accomplish what end? Isn't this enough for your readers? To know that there's another world on the other side? What more can I show you? He hovers up towards the ceiling, glowing blue lightning bolts shooting from his fingertips. Your world is nothing compared to this one. 
The light energy from Earth can be brought to this reality. It can be directed with only a thought. Your life force is worthless on Earth, but here... Here it is another power plant added to the growing number that fuel me. I can do anything here. This entire city formed with only thoughts and energy. Soon this world will glow with life just like ours. And I will rule over all of it. So that's what it comes down to. Power. You just want this world for yourself. Infinite power in a world of shadow people controlled by you doing your bidding. A global empire made of darkness. Did you ever consider that this place wasn't meant to be tampered with? Watch your words carefully. This can be quick and painless, or I can make it otherwise. The choice is up to you. The woman in black suddenly begins to glow as well, and floats up towards the ceiling to join him there. The eyes of them both are blank and white as they stare at us, and the room begins to hum with electricity that shoots off of them like lightning. The air sizzles and pops with energy. Any final words before you can speak no longer? For once in my life, I can think of nothing to ask. I shake my head, no. I take one last breath of alien air in this world that is not ours, and await my fate. The woman in black pulls back her veil. I understand why it is there now. What is beneath is far more horrifying than I could have imagined. It makes my heart stop for a second, and I lurch forward, breathless. As the light begins to shimmer all around me, I see our energy flowing like a river towards her and Garrett, and they drink it in like water. I can feel the life draining out of me, the light draining out of me. And then a noise like trees and foliage rustling comes from behind us. I look back and see a strange sight. From beneath the bus, a tree is emerging. Only this tree has arms and legs. As he stands tall, I can see he is a massive being, his head nearly touching the ceiling in the cavernous room. It is the tree man from the forest. He'd been a stowaway beneath the bus since we stopped, it would seem. By the looks of it, he somehow attached himself to the bottom of the bus with the vines that slithered and moved around him like snakes. What the hell is that thing? You were not meant to come here. Neither were you, Mother of Death. You were to stay in the forest. But you rebuked the rules. You chose to interfere. You chose power over structure. Darkness over light. Garrett and the woman in black are floating near the ceiling as their eyes meet the tree man's eyes. They raise their hands and dark energy pours forth, like living fire the color of smoke. It attacks the tree. His leaves and bark catch a blaze in places and he stumbles backwards for a second. I can see his mossy mouth twitching with what could be pain, but overall the attack is insignificant. He stamps out the small fires that have formed in places across his chest where the attack was focused. In an instant, the power is dwindling down, and I see Garrett's face in the dawning apprehension there. The sounds of many footfalls fill the room, more and more by the second, hundreds and then thousands of them. They are outside, climbing the building, smashing the windows on the roof. Get back on the bus. It may be too late for you, but you must at least try to make it back to your world. You must warn people not to ride that bus. He is too powerful. He cannot be stopped if we don't do something. I remember the words Garrett and Carrie had exchanged. The mention about time dilation. It might already be too late. We climb onto the bus just before the shadow people begin to pour in. They swarm, and soon the room is full of them. They ignore us and head straight for Garrett and the woman in black. The mother of death. I look out the window of the bus and with the night vision technology can make out the scene perfectly. My heart hammering with terror and relief at having escaped. I can't pry my eyes away. Garrett is being torn to pieces by the shadow people. He brought them all here from various dimensions, I would find out later. They were all victims of his power grab. His attempt to gain dominion over this place. The world that lies beneath all other worlds. The Shadow Realm. They pull off his face and rip off his arms. Plunging their hands into his chest, they tear out his heart, and his blue and glowing blood goes everywhere. The shadow people drink it in and begin to look human again. As Carrie orders the bus to reverse and the elevator doors close, I wonder what will happen to them, if they'll make it back to where they came from.
The journey back to the giant oak tree was uneventful, so I won't bore you with the details of it. When we arrive at the entrance to the forest, it opens up for us, welcoming us. The trees move to the side and create a pathway for the bus, hopeful for our departure from this world. Ted and Wayne made it back on the bus with us, and have decided to enforce Garrett's orders. They make me hand over my laptop to carry after the giant oak swallows the bus in darkness once again, and the realm of Earth appears on the other side. I only hope that she will stop this madness, and participate in Garrett's horrible venture no more. I tell her this. Well, I guess I'm the new lead engineer now. You know, I've always wanted to research dark energy, dark matter, very interesting topics. I brought this back to study. In her hand, she holds a chunk of rubble from the Proteon building, like a souvenir of our close encounter with death. She gasps as she inspects the utterly dark surface of it. It absorbs all light and casts a growing shadow. The shadow extends, and I realize it is not a shadow at all, but that the blackness of it is spreading like a malignancy across Carrie's hand. Reflexively, she drops the black stone to the ground. It stops the spread of necrotic death that is making its way across her flesh, but it begins to spread instead across the floor, slowly, like a puddle of oil as it expands, and it does not stop. Oh, I suppose I shouldn't have brought that back here. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacado, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larry Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus video and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. The first story, featuring multiple patrons as characters, will be coming this Wednesday, and will also be connected to the story you just heard. So stay tuned for that this Wednesday, September 27th, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.